Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Rehabilitation After COVID-19 Allied Health Provider Education Series. My name is Sherry Henderson, and I'm the Occupational Therapy Practice Lead at the Royal Alex in Edmonton, and I'm moderating the session today. Please note that this session, along with the question and answer period, is being recorded. This is the second in a series of webinars that we're encouraging all providers to tune into as many of the sessions as possible. The series is meant to address the biopsychosocial perspectives of rehab and recovery post COVID, and it is available to rehabilitation and allied health staff. Other staff groups may find the material applicable, but they're responsible for aligning it with their own clinical policies and procedures. Every effort has been made to incorporate the best current evidence and information available, but keep in mind that the information and new evidence is changing really rapidly, particularly regarding COVID-19, and we're all learning together as we go. We're really excited to have such great interest in the sessions. Because of the high number of participants, we ask that you please keep the audio lines muted and that you use the chat function to type in any questions. The chat button is at the bottom of your screen in the middle. I want you to please use a direct message to the participant entitled questions, which is actually me, and I'm going to send a direct message or a message out to everybody right now. So if you have a question, reply directly to questions, and we're going to gather those all together, and then we'll have time at the end for a little bit of Q&A. If you have any trouble finding the chat or you think of questions after the session, feel free to email those to practice.consultation at ahs.ca and we're going to um, we're going to have a slide at the end that will review that address again. The slide deck for today as well as the calendar for any future sessions is going to be on the Allied Health Practice and Education uh, Education Hub and I'm going to put that inside or that address. Oh look at somebody else already put that in. Thank you. So you can find the slide deck um, at this website as well if you are an AHS or Covenant um, employee, if you are joining us from outside of AHS or Covenant, then please direct message Allied Health Education and they will arrange to get you the slide deck. So that's all of the housekeeping pieces. Uh, thank you for bearing with all of that. I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today, who is Christine Hunter. Christine is the OT team lead at the Community Interdisciplinary Rehab Service, or the CRIS program here in Edmonton. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing her topic today on maximizing energy and returning to daily activities. Take it away, Christine. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. I wanted to start off the webinar um, by thanking those who contributed to today's presentation. Uh, I feel fortunate enough to have been able to collaborate with so many great minds on the topic of, of energy management. So there we go, my apologies. Um, big thank you out to, to these lovely folk, including my team here at, at Chris. We've been working together for years to support clients uh, manage their energy. So this is something we're, um, you know, uh, been working on for a long time as of many uh, OTs out there in the community. So just want to acknowledge that there's lots of people um, in different settings uh, working with the energy maximization skills and energy management skills with their clients and there's lots of knowledge out there. So I'm pretty excited to be able to share some thoughts on it today. All right, so just getting into a brief overview, uh, our outline for today, um, we'll do a brief overview of fatigue and COVID-19, talk about recovery patterns, and get into some energy maximization for post-COVID uh, fatigue. So uh, looking at three concepts, so one is the uh, concept of six Ps, uh, energy budgeting, rules for rest and sleep considerations, and then we'll finish up with a brief uh, case study. All right, so um, as you can see here, um, when we look at uh, post-COVID has some persistent physical symptoms for some clients. Um, the most frequently identified persistent persisted symptom is fatigue. Um, it's important to note that uh, psychological and cognitive complaints are also quite common um, and these can be influenced or are influenced by fatigue. Okay. And although there's no widely accepted definitions of stages of COVID-19 recovery, the following are typical categories. So there's that acute phase, kind of the four weeks um, following the onset of symptoms, ongoing symptomatic, which is kind of the 12 to, uh, sorry, pardon me, four to 12 weeks. And then we've got the post-COVID, um, which is kind of uh, greater than 12 weeks. Now we're hearing that being called different names and I don't think anyone's landed on one single name, but you may hear it being called long haul COVID or chronic COVID as well. All right, so we kind of, um, seeing um, 
you know, kind of two groups of, of client experiences that we're going to, you know, uh, identify today. Um, so there's there's clients who kind of come out of hospital setting. Um, not that we're trying to pigeonhole any clients into any specific things, but we are kind of seeing, a, you know, some some phenotypes uh, developing. Um, and so there's that uh, post hospitalization group, and when they're looking to return to activities, just some stats on that: that only about 40% of patients were independent in all activities of daily living at 30 days. Um, another study identifying that 40% of patients were unable to turn to normal activities at 60 days post uh, hospital discharge. So we look now at the outpatient group, those people who are more mild COVID-19 uh, and did not require hospitalization, um, but they are noting prolonged and persistent symptoms up to several months as well, if not longer, um, following their acute illness. Um, and so these are kind of two, two client group experiences that are, that are interesting to, to note. So um, when talking with other uh, allied health clinicians, um, we, we're using the skills and strategies similar to those um, seen uh, that we've used in, in other um, managing other conditions. Um, and we're finding that they're working well with uh, supporting COVID clients. Uh, so uh, where we've been drawing from, um, from the post concussed concussion work from persistent pain and fibromyalgia, um, multiple sclerosis, ME, chronic fatigue, cancer, and, and many more. Okay. So fatigue is multifactorial. Um, so this is just a little opportunity and a little maybe simplistic of kind of breakdown of fatigue, but fatigue can come from primary factors. So meaning that, you know, it's the result of a disease or a medical condition. Um, and so uh, we did, uh, there's a great presentation, if you haven't watched it yet, um, last week done within this series, um, and they identified COVID's clinical presentation is being characterized by post-exertional uh, uh, symptom exacerbation, cardiac impairment, significant dyspnea, exertional desaturation, uh, dysautonomia, and orthostatic intolerance, okay? So when we look at the secondary fatigue factors, and those are fatigue that may fatigue that may not be the direct result of the diagnosis, more of an indirect result, um, and these symptoms um, can be reduced through behavior and, and lifestyle changes. And so those factors um, include um, changes to habits, routines, activity levels, and certainly that's something that you know the general population has been experiencing as well. Um, dietary changes, um, and there is an upcoming webinar on on uh, on nutrition and eating on July thirteenth. Um, that a lot of these clients had very high role demands prior to um, prior to experiencing COVID. Um, it also factors in their baseline energy uh, reserves and activity levels. Uh, mood, of course, plays a factor in fatigue, as does stress and anxiety. And um, one of the things we'll be talking a bit more today is, is how people use their energy and a kind of a cycl cyclical pattern of kind of push, crash, or bust, boom cycles. So some client experience uh, thoughts here. What are people saying about their experience with post-COVID fatigue? So some of the comments I've been hearing is it feels like I'm not living. It's like I'm in a spider web. The harder I push, the faster I get pulled back. Uh, feeling like a jigsaw puzzle. It's difficult to put the pieces of my life back together. I used to work two jobs, play sports, and now I can't even make a meal. So one of the things that we're finding, you know, extremely important as it is with most client populations is that we um, acknowledge, validate, and normalize the client experience. That it, um, that's really important, particularly for people who, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of them are coming up to their year anniversary of, of COVID, having COVID now, and, and they're still not feeling better. And so it's, there's a lot of judgment and shame and a lot of emotions that, uh, that surround that. So getting into talking a bit about post-COVID recovery. So often clients' expectations for recovery are not matching their actual recovery patterns. So people usually think, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of commented that sometimes people say, oh, it's just like the flu and you can recover and you get better. And yes, that's been some people's experience where, you know, they have a, a week or two where they're feeling unwell, but they have a you know, steady improvement. Um, but for the for a large section of, of other people as well, there it's it's not necessarily linear and it's characterized by relapses and it's slower than they want it to be. And for some people, it's you know slow over months and some people now into years. Um, it's a there's a loss of meaningful activities and routines. Uh, the need to explain and defend their experience, which is leading to isolation, uh, that they have less control over their recovery. So they're putting in the more effort they put in um, is not equaling a faster recovery. So they're not getting that return for effort. So speaking a bit more to that kind of post-COVID non-linear recovery, um, you know, re recovery typically isn't a straight line. You're not going to get better from one day to the next, to the next, to the next, because even before COVID, we had high energy days and low energy days. Um, energy crashes um, in recovery are, are not uncommon because we have a tendency towards overdoing things when we're feeling a bit better. 
Um, it's important to encourage people to look at the overall progress. So you can use things like tracking sheets or progressive uh, goal planning to support this. Uh, and also to reinforce that this has been a typical experience for a lot of people post COVID that recovery is slow. So it's that idea of reinforcing the tortoise and the hare scenario that the tortoise is the one who's going to win this race. Um, yeah. So some patterns for activity re-engagement that we see um, is, is the wait until, right? Waiting until I'm feeling better. So I'll return to doing these things when I feel better. The other one that we can see is what we call the push crash, or you may be more commonly termed with um, boom bust, um, but that's just that idea of, um, you know, really pushing through um, and then, you know, not being able to do much for, for days or weeks after that push. So just using some, some graphics here to help illustrate that. So we're looking at activity levels. So green is the activity level that's within their activity threshold, meaning that it's not going to create um, post-exertional malaise or increase their fatigue. The yellow zone, which is that be cautious zone, uh, that's where their threshold is. And then the red zone, which is kind of indicating even when we do this level of activity, we're likely going to um, have some effects of some significant prolonged fatigue afterwards. So the problem with the wait until is that over time, we just increasingly become more deconditioned to have more role loss. Um, so what we're looking to change that to is we're looking to change that to an activity pattern where we work within our available energy and not creating fatigue cycles, but that we're teasing at this threshold that we're getting into the yellow zones and, and we're seeing that. So what we call it kind of a term we're going to use here, but today is called um, uh, pacing with precaution. Okay, the other um, kind of pattern we see, and this is the one that's most described within the, the post COVID literature is a real crash push, uh, sorry, push crash cycle, meaning that they do it, a lot of activity more than their, their body is able to tolerate at this point in time. Uh, they kind of over, overdo it from an activity level tolerant, tolerance uh, standpoint, um, and then they, they crash and can't do much at all for days. So they get very little accomplished and, and, you know, and then the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. Uh, and yes, over time, people will recover, um, but the recovery is likely not to be as quick as they'd like it to be if they're continually in this kind of cr uh, push crash cycle. Um, some people call it the crash and burn cycle because it just feels that it's such a, a letdown when you go into one of these uh, energy lows. So again, we're looking for that ideal energy management. We're looking for that staying within the green zone and teasing within to the yellow zone. All right. So I used that term a little bit earlier. Some people may or may not be familiar with it, but the idea of post-exertional malaise or an energy crash. So these can be physical, emotional, or cognitive. And it's really important to recognize that because a client can say, um, you know, I'm really tired, but all I did today was sit on Zoom calls, but yet now I'm having trouble kind of, you know, having the energy to walk across the room. Well, the energy all kind of comes from the same tank. So if you drain one tank, it's going to have an impact on the other energy tank. They're all from the same pool of energy. Um, so post-exertional malaise is the worsening of symptoms following even minor physical or mental exertion, with symptoms typically worsening for 12 to 48 hours after activity and can last for days, even weeks for some people. That's a lot. That's a long time to recover from kind of one or two days of overdoing it. So just describing this push crash cycle a little bit more, you know, we're kind of recognizing that clients um, can have some physical disruption. So there's, you know, uh, fatigue, they're feeling tired, some cognitive disturbances. Um, but what also, it's not just a physical experience that this, this changes, this physical experience just changes how they think, right? Um, I should be better by now. Why am I not getting better? Nobody understands me. I want my old life back, right? And those feelings are driven by emotions as well. And one of the emotions we hear a lot within uh, post-COVID is anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of shame. And so these emotions and thoughts are intertwined with the physical. And those are what really often drive the behavior of that boom bust or push crash is those emotions and thoughts and how they contribute to it. So we have the physical fatigue and you have cognitive fatigue and emotional fatigue that leads to what I call stinking thinking, which, you know, is, is tied in with the emotions that we're feeling in it that creates behaviors often. So push crash behavior. So I always feel like to think a little bit about that Inside Out movie. Maybe some of you have seen it, maybe some of you haven't, um, you know, where the, uh, the movie really describes this, this teenage girl who's having to move and leave her friends and the different uh, thoughts and emotions she's going through. And when each of them take control over her reactions, they, um, depending on who's, who's, who's driving her at the time, um, it can lead to some um, poor outcomes for her. All right, so improvement using energy management often requires behavior change. 
Okay, so it's not just teaching energy maximization if the person isn't giving themselves permission or isn't utilizing it or isn't recognizing that things need to change in order to move forward. Um, that's tough to do, right, um, without that. So um, when we're looking at some of the things that can support behavior change, you know, being client and goal centered um, can really be supportive of that. Assisting the client to find their own strategies, so using that strength-based approach. Uh, assisting clients to recognize their limitations and adapt to the limitations, that's really the essence of things here. Um, explore with the client how they can best make decisions, giving some control back to them that yes, there is some controllability in this experience for you. Supporting uh, clients um, that accepting the need to pace. And I don't like the term accepting. I, it's not a term that I, I, I like because I don't think people ever accept something like, like this. Um, but, but it's that idea of, of understanding or knowing that I need to adapt and giving themselves permission to do that self-compassion skills. Um, something that's drawn heavily on here is people that those thoughts and those emotions and particularly those thinking patterns are often not quite nice and they're usually not kind to themselves. So kind of trying to introduce some of those, those skills. Um, and that comes from sometimes that normalizing and acknowledging can support that as well. Prioritizing self and health is the path to recovery that pushing through and just doing probably isn't going to get you where you need to go. And I stealing this from the, uh, the last presentation, but rest is like medicine. All right, so this is a term energy maximization. Some of you may be more familiar with the term energy conservation. Um, in some work with MS with, with clients, they, uh, well, actually maybe first, let me just ask you this question and you think about it. If I were to offer you two options, you're recovering from COVID, I'm gonna offer you two options. I'm gonna offer you energy conservation or I'm gonna offer you energy maximization. What would you pick? So the majority of people that I talk to and my clients kind of say, well, I looked at energy conservation, but I thought that was doing less. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so the language matters. So the use of empowering languages can go a long way. Um, I'll use the term energy maximization, but you feel free to insert energy conservation, fatigue management, energy management, whatever language works for you. Um, yeah, so I hope introducing you to a, a new term today, maybe, or maybe some of you already use that terminology. So what are the core features of a fatigue management program? This comes from some work done by Marcia Finlayson. Um, and uh, she identified the, the components of being knowledge development. So an example of knowledge development would be helping clients to understand the push cross cycle, maybe introduce them to the six Ps. Skill development, that idea of self-monitoring planning, those are vital skills when we talk about fatigue management. And then the big piece that we've been talking about a lot just now is that idea of cognitive restructuring, right? That a need to accept pacing and, and that idea of being kind to self and that idea of working within our limits. So some of the strategies that can help clients to uh, with this is practice, right? It is practice and then the opportunity for reflection. Okay, so what is it like if instead of, you know, getting all your things done first thing in the morning, we paste it over for the day and then reflecting back, well, how was your energy? Could you do more in the evening? And then structuring things for success. Uh, to date, a lot of these clients are structuring, uh, unfortunately, for failure because they're in the push crash cycle. And so finding some success, even a small success can go a long way. All right, so I wanted to introduce you to some of these energy maximization concepts. And again, their fatigue management, um, energy conservation techniques, what have you, use your term. Um, and these are only some of the techniques. These are just some of the ones I wanted to introduce today. So we've got energy budgeting, the six Ps, rules for rest. So energy budget. Um, your bank account will use energy like money. Just like an account, uh, you need to be aware of how much money is available. If you have a limited amount of energy, you need to budget and spend wisely. Energy overdraft means that you have to pay back the energy, it usually comes at an interest. Uh, if you use more energy than you have, you will become withdrawn. And as we know with an overdraft, it takes a lot longer to pay back an overdraft than the initial uh, cost. So I'll give you an example of sometimes how I introduce budgeting to clients. Um, I'll ask them how much their energy is reduced, let's say from the pre-COVID state. So let's say 50%. So I would come back with, okay, if you typically have a $200 grocery budget and it suddenly becomes 100, just kind of like your energy has gone down by half, what could you do differently to support the budget, this change in budget? And so the client responded to me, I would prioritize the items that I'm purchasing. I would plan my meals, look for ways to maximize my, my money. Uh, I'd spread meat out over the week because it's expensive. All right. So then the next step is kind of turning it again and, and getting her to find the answers for us is, you know, could any of these ideas be applied to support your energy? 
hmm. work together on this one a little bit. I could prioritize my activities, plan my activities. She identified that she could make a schedule for her energy utilization and that she thought that pacing herself during the activities. So kind of like the, with the meat, kind of spacing it out and breaking it up over the week or what we call pacing. All right, so moving on to those P's and you'll see back from the last slide, I've kind of identified some of the P's. So when we're talking about budgeting, budgeting and the P's kind of intertwine a little bit. So um, the P's are different depending on where you look. There can be three P's, four P's, five P's, six P's, seven P's. This may not be the P's you use. You may have purse breathing in here. You may have patience in here. You may have lots of different P's. There's wonderful, great P words that can help support energy management. Um, so the ones that I'm going to identify today, because these are the ones that kind of um, uh, I find uh, that I use most regularly um, is the idea of pacing. But um, after listening to a long haul um, COVID uh, PT uh, podcast, uh, the gentleman on there used pacing with precaution. And I thought that was an excellent way of really identifying the difference here between post COVID and, and other conditions is that pacing with precaution. It, it's important in other conditions as well, but it's critical within the, the, the post COVID uh, population. Uh, so pacing, you know, is working that appropriate pace and taking frequent rest breaks, allowing you to work longer. Again, that theme of maximization. We're not doing less just to do less. We're doing less to do more. Kind of a, an odd concept. Um, that idea of planning. So creating a plan for the day of the week so that um, you can balance those activities, those high energy tasks and low energy tasks. Um, the idea of prioritizing. It's important to determine uh, which activities are priority for you to complete and making sure that we balance in a little bit of fun in there too, because life isn't just about work and tasks. Um, positioning, this can be a key one as well, and that's changing or supporting your body position can reduce the amount of energy you use. So the, the, the one I always default to is that if we do something in sitting versus standing, we typically reduce our energy cost by about 25%. So that's a really good rule that people can kind of take around with them and kind of look for opportunities to sit versus stand. Um, yeah, prioritizing, making sure important uh, to determine which activities are priority for you. And then patience and permission. This is a really key one. It's giving yourself permission to do things differently and, and having that patience to, um, to know that things are going to take a bit longer right now. All right. So pacing when doing less can help us do more. It helps us to avoid the push crash cycle. Pacing um, offers a way to reduce symptoms, regain control, and increases chances for improvement. Here's a quote that I'll share with you. Uh, pacing pushes you while protecting you, um, which is what exactly what we need to make progress when we're physically or emotionally vulnerable. All right. So we talked about that concept of pacing with precaution, um, and that's kind of that idea of finding limits. Um, so self-monitoring and self-management, right? So how are clients going to monitor themselves to make sure they stay out of that red zone? How are they going to know this, right? So some of the tools that um, can be used to support the client in doing that is self-monitoring and self-management techniques. So these are some of the options that I've heard people are using currently, you know, visual analog scales, rate of perceived exertion, dyspnea scales. Um, O2 sat, uh, saturation tracking, heart rate is a big one that I've heard a lot about, logging forms are another one, uh, the timing of the length of the activity, um, one of the scales, uh, dismiss scales could be the modified Borg scale. So these are all options um, that would be uh, there for you. Now, I find it quite helpful to work with a physiotherapist to help kind of determine what those limits are and what how we're going to be gauging that and then help to reinforce that when it comes to um, activities of daily living. So uh, another precaution to think about, avoiding adding to a full plate. So most of the clients with post-COVID are not getting through their day as it is without getting into a crash, um, a crash cycle. Um, and so working with the clients to stay within their activity limits for occupational performance and activities of daily living, you kind of need to address that prior to adding in new activities and exercises or rehab tasks, right? If the plate is full, we have to balance it. So is there too much mashed potatoes on here? Can we take some off? What could we, what could we do to add in some dessert? on this plate. Okay. Important to recognize that activities of daily living can be broken down in three ways. There's the activity and doing activity analysis. You can use those P's. So an idea, uh, an example of an activity is laundry. Uh, that's an activity that we can break down and, and look for ways of, of maximizing energy. Uh, looking at the day. So using a day timer to plan the day, including planning and rest and wellness activities. And then looking at the week. So spreading out some of those more heavier uh, tasks and activities like vacuuming and laundry and making them on separate days. And as I said before, reminding the clients to build in some fun into their day because that's part of what's going to help them kind of make, make improvements, balancing life in general. 
right? So how do we break out of this push craft cycle? How do we develop new activity patterns? So recognizing symptoms of uh, fatigue and, and triggers for fatigue, that's kind of a, a critical one, is that self-awareness and self-monitoring. What activities do I do? Are they more cognitive tasks? Are they more physical tasks? Is that when I do a whole bunch of them together, what, what's, what are the triggers? Find the limits. Right. So we talk looking back to that red, yellow and green. Where's where's the limit? How can I stay in the green and tease into the yellow? Um, adapting to those limits so that as that becomes easier, that we're, we're progressing. Um, pardon me, adapting is just kind of get, getting used to those limits. And then the final one, expanding those limits of how do we move forward out of that? The pacing isn't just about, you know, staying at the same consistent pace. It's about moving forward. All right, so adapting to limits, learning to work within their limits. So what are their current activity limits? What is their green zone? Um, how long can they perform these activities before they potentially experience um, uh, PEM? So some examples of things that can be broken down are things like dressing, household activities, reading, spending time with people, exercise. People really wanna get back to exercise. And one of the things I hear uh, you know, a lot about is people's concern about their fitness level or their weight gain um, due to this. It's really kind of front and forefront for a lot of people's mind in a lot of people's minds progressive planning uh, i like this term a lot um it's that concept of um you know making sure that when we're setting goals that they're progressive kind of bite-sized goals the key thing to recognize um here is that um Progressions are based on activity tolerance, not on timelines. So this idea here that we've got week one, week two, week three, week four, five, we're not going by that when it comes to COVID. This is a big ixnay. We are going based on their activity tolerances, okay? And as I said, having a plan to how to monitor that activity tolerance. And so we talked about heart rate, we talked about logging forms, we talked about time tracking, those are options, okay? So again, we're looking to stay, oops, pardon me, stay out of the red, out of that high activity level, uh, staying in that just right green zone and making sure we're not getting into the to low activity level. And again, that tortoise in the hair, right, is that this may feel slow and very flow, slow for some people, but the idea is that we're kind of getting onto a, a steady line, not a wavy up and down line, right? We're not getting those big, we're always going to have some levels of ups and downs, but it's not going to be big crashes um, and big expenditures in energy. Right. So one of the tools we were talking about was that idea of activity logs, right? And this can be used with planning. Um, activity logs can be that idea of just recording what the clients are doing in their day right now, how they're feeling for their, you know, their energy levels or their feelings of wellness. Logs can help clients spot those unhelpful activity patterns, such as irregular sleep patterns and those push crash behaviors. Um, a little bit of caution with this one. When you're looking at um, so acutely, you can become very symptom focused. So this is something I wouldn't do for more than a couple of days, just for people to kind of identify some of the cycles. And then they may continue to monitor, but I'm more on a gross level of just kind of looking at their overall feelings of wellness, um, how they're doing, and just kind of what their you know daily activities kind of generally look like. Try not to stick in the nitty gritty for too long. In fact, what I often do is flip this between let's take a look at, you know, where you were here and now let's start using this as planning, right? How do we plan out our day? Okay, so where are we planning on our rest breaks? What kind of planning can we do with this? And I find that helpful to kind of take that same uh, worksheet and kind of use it through uh, with, with a client. There is tons of activity logging sheets. There's very complicated ones that can even add up points of how much energy you're expending. So you can graph it um, and do all sorts of fun things with them. There's very basic ones that just look like morning, afternoon, and evening, or, you know, are you, you know, are you in the red zone, the yellow zone, or the green zone? And so it's important to keep in mind the cognitive and emotional level of your clients, right? If somebody's already hyper-focused in on their symptoms, this may not be the activity for them. Rules for rest, uh, very important concept uh, within energy maximization. So resting before they're fatigued, most people wait until they're tired before they rest. So if we can coach clients into uh, resting just as they're starting to notice some of the signs of fatigue, taking a short rest, right? So we're finding that people take more short frequent rest breaks, it actually often ends up being less overall rest time in the end because they're out of that push crash cycle. So they actually get more accomplished. So again, this is that concept of maximizing energy, not conserving it, um, at least the, the terms. Um, so um, plan rest into the schedule first and then the activities around it, right? So really putting that priority on rest that we know rest is one of the pathways to recovery. So how do we make sure it's planned in? Um, making rest a habit. So think about rest as an activity and plan it into the day. So to use budgeting terms, rest is, is an investment in your health. Okay, types of rest. So um, this is something we found within the post-COVID population is oftentimes uh, people are very A-type driven individuals. Um, 
And so it can be helpful to give more structured rest um, and also talk about the quality of the rest as well, right? So watching TV is not cognitively, uh, is not a cognitively undemanding task. There is, you know, visual processing going on, auditory processing, the scenes are changing all the time. It's actually a, a more, um, more cognitive outlay than they may be anticipating that it was. So um, talking about other ways of resting, relaxation techniques, mindfulness, breathing exercises, great website out of John Hopkins on post-COVID. Um, breathing exercises, um, switching to podcasts instead of television. So we're not kind of using so many systems at, at work at the same time, resting and listening to music. And that idea of one of those other P's of positioning at rest, right? Are you slumped in a chair? Are you, you know, in a supported, uh, you know, reclined position? Um, you know, when you're working at your computer or when you're watching TV, yeah. Are you in that restful position or is your body working hard to maintain that position? Okay, so sleep uh, and post-COVID fatigue. Um, it can be helpful to screen for sleeping difficulties as they can have an impact on energy, recovery, and overall health, including fatigue, mood, and cognition. Uh, types of sleep disorders that are being seen, and they're being seen in the general population as well as the post-COVID population, uh, insomnia disorders, so difficulties with falling asleep and staying asleep, uh, circadian rhythm uh, sleep-wake disorder, particularly the delayed type, which essentially means that people are, you know, not going to bed until uh, very late in the in 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 the morning, technically, um, and then having a hard time kind of getting up at, at a typical time in the morning. Um, and then we've been hearing about people uh, having concerns with falling asleep unintentionally, but you know, I mean, as soon as they, you know, get into a car as the passenger, you know, that they're immediately falling asleep, and that was not their their plan or intention. Uh, it can be important, like many populations, when somebody is not having restorative sleep, it can be really important to consider is sleep apnea uh, a consideration. And so using a screening tool like the stop bang, um, or just asking some questions about are they feeling restored in the morning? Um, is your partner noticing any changes in your sleeping, like, you know, snoring loudly or any disruptions in breathing? So causes of sleep disruption, uh, I think we, you know, we've all had experience of sleep disruption from time to time, um, you know, increased stress and anxiety, uh, certainly during COVID, everybody's experienced their fair share of this and definitely the people who have experienced COVID, that's probably been an increase for them. Um, loss of daily routines, increased screen time, changes in sleep behavior, bedtime, wake times, uh, physiological changes like breathing changes and other, uh, and other features of, of, of COVID. Um, and nightmares has been something that we've uh, heard a lot of reports about. Uh, so what can we do about it? Some sleep supports, uh, sleep hygiene. Um, so strategies are always important, right? Um, you know, trying to reduce screen time before bed, um, you know, all, all the other good stuff, making sure you're sleeping in a, in a good environment that's right for, for falling asleep and staying asleep. Um, for those people who are having some phase shifts with their sleeping as, you know, kind of looking to develop a same wake up time and one that we kind of move back slowly, not suddenly, you know, you're waking up every day at one o'clock and suddenly we're going to ask you to wake up every morning at, at eight. So that's not a very realistic shift. Relaxation techniques are fantastic. Lots of different ones out there. Finding the right technique for the client. Um, increased daytime activity. So two things drive sleep. One is your circadian rhythm. So that light, uh, you know, light exposure during the day and that internal clock. Um, and how much activity you do in the day. Those are the two main drivers. So people with post-COVID who are having a hard time doing activities, they're having a reduced sleep drive at nighttime. Um, so that idea of returning to activities, both at bedtime and, and during the day. Um, and if people are experiencing some significant challenges is, you know, considering something like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. All right, so we're moving into a case scenario here. Uh, this is Santana. She's a 49-year-old female. She had a COVID diagnosis in October of 2020. Um, previously held two jobs, very active in sports and with her grandchildren. Uh, some of the symptoms that she reports post-COVID is significant fatigue. When we did her Canadian occupational performance measure where she identified her problems, basically when I went through the list of anything she identified, pretty much everything went back to fatigue as being the barrier but not everything. She also is experiencing pain. Um, there's also a significant amount of anxiety, which is really kind of the amount of time she was spending worrying about things was certainly um, playing into her activity or uh, to her energy levels as well. And she had some, some, some dyspnea as well. So with Santana, I did not sharing everything that I that I did with her, but I just want to take you through an, an example of activity analysis that we that we we did using the six P's because she really thought that it was really important that um, she really wanted to do her hair and makeup very important to her and it was something she wasn't doing. 
um, and, and it was, you know, very important for her, for Mood to do this. So um, this is something she identified as a priority. So this is, you know, out of all the things she needed to do in, in the day, this was really important to her because she felt it would help support her mood. Um, so we engaged in problem solving. Um, we talked about positioning. She identified right away, I could sit to do these tasks. And she identified that blowing her hair upside down. Um, one of the things that I added in is, you know, supporting, you know, with elbows on, on the table. So it was less overhead work. Um, we worked together on kind of pacing and planning. So uh, when could rest breaks happen? How often? That idea of, you know, rules for rest of, you know, d stopping before you're getting tired. Um, you know, so taking those breaks between and during and between the activities and set a timeline for accomplishment that was um, appropriate. So instead of trying to have it all done by nine, what if we just set a, a you know, far out target of noon? Because we really wanted to guarantee her success with this, right? So I kind of knew what she was doing already for the activity levels. And so, you know, kind of wanted to, she was really sandwiching together and trying to get it all done at once, both her hair and her makeup. And so it was leading to, it was too much at once. Um, and so, you know, spreading it out and making a timeline realistic. So as long as we're done by kind of noon here. Um, so we identified strategies for managing the moods and thoughts because she's somebody who switched very quickly into self judgment uh, and to and to, to shame and blame and so um the end goal that we so we yeah we worked on some of the strategies but included some countering thoughts um, that she would kind of give herself she was even going to write a post-it note with some of those countering thoughts so that as she was doing her hair and makeup she was we had a visual reminder of what she was trying to accomplish and so her goal landed in uh, she wanted to be able to do in hair and makeup before noon just two days during the week and she was going to use the plan so the other important piece of this was Santana was aware that we were trialing a strategy that may need to be revised, right? So if she set the expectation that was she, this was going to be successful and she was going to be able to do this and it was going to go great and then it didn't work, it would just feed into that kind of, you know, failure cycle and that she wouldn't make improvements. So we really wanted to establish this as let's try this out. And if it doesn't work, we're going to revisit it and change it up a bit. All right, so some tools that may help you in your journey of supporting post uh, COVID clients. Uh, fatigue scales, those can be really helpful. Um, the sleep screens may be helpful. Dysmia scales, activity logs and daily planners, self monitoring aids like fitness trackers, heart rate monitors, different apps where people can log information. Uh, goal setting tools like the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure or progressive goal setting sheets motivational interviewing skills, and uh, the rehabilitation screening tool that was presented at last week. So what are we hearing from some clients after implementing energy maximization? The small changes are adding up over time. I feel like I've been given permission to make change and listen to my body. I worry less about stigma. Now I, have a, I, have, I feel like I have some control and some choice. I have a wellness plan and it's on my fridge. I like that one a lot. So in summary, uh, some people with COVID experience prolonged recovery times not uh, related to the initial severity of, of COVID-19. So understanding recovery patterns, avoiding the push crash and wait until can help support recovery. Um, behavior change is a core of energy maximization. So, you know, looking at those concepts of uh, acceptance, you know, I don't like that term, um, and permission. Um, and, and that progressing uh, progressing and moving forward is based on um, avoiding uh, post-exertional malaise, not on timelines. This is a tortoise and hare approach. The use of energy maximization strategies is key to clients returning to activity. And just a shout out for OTs, you know, and a lot of people can implement these principles as well, but OTs are fatigue management superheroes. And if you have questions about fatigue management, certainly reach out to your, your, your local OT. I bet you they know lots about it. And if they don't, they can reach out to one of their colleagues who does. Um, and that is uh, the end of my presentation. It's very interesting not getting feedback during a presentation. So I'm excited to hear some of the comments that may and questions that may be, may be in the chat room. Well, I can give you feedback, Christine. That was awesome. Thank you so much for, for all the work you put into that. Um, maybe we will, there, there's been a couple questions that have come up in the, in the chat box. And now that the presentation's done, I suspect we, we can get some more. So just a reminder, if you've come on after, if you can direct questions to questions, I've renamed myself questions, and that allows us to um, have that written record as well. In addition to Christine, we have a number of the uh, um, subject matter people that contributed in that first slide she put, um, thanking, uh, thanking the, the, the group mind, uh, and some of those people I know joined us as well. So we've got, um, we've got some great um, people here. So as people are maybe thinking of their questions, and, and I've got one or two there, maybe Christine, let's do the housekeeping slides here, and then that'll give everybody a second. So thank you for that. So as 
as we mentioned from the beginning, uh, at the beginning that this is part of a series of additional webinars. So next week, uh, we'll be having resuming activity and exercise and um, you'll see the following dates there. As well, there is um, starting after the webinar series is done, we are going to be initiating a community of practice starting on July 27th and running through the rest of the summer. That is um, about caring for the person. So that will be looking at some of those psychosocial um, uh, uh, supports both for, for clients and for providers themselves. So the calendar for both the webinar series and the community of practice is on that allied health education hub as well. Can you forward the slide for me, Christine? Thank you. Um, also within that um, uh, that hub and additionally on this link, there is a post-COVID provider resource page that's available both internally and externally um, for staff on the HS website. So uh, links to these webinars as well as some of the other information um, and a specifically a provider resource document that uh, Caitlin and, and Lauren and Laura talked about last week. Oh, look at you, Christine, you're the best fan ever. Um, and so this, uh, this document is again for providers providing care to um, clients with post-COVID, a variety of topics, and it's meant to be a living document. So some of the sections are um, completed, some of them are still to come. So please keep checking back. Um, and if you have, you know, your own experiences, uh, clients that you're seeing and, and have something to contribute, please feel free to reach out to the practice consultation team. And, and uh, we're always looking for, for uh, um, experiences, because as we said, we're all kind of figuring this out as we go. Next slide, Christine. Um, I'd also like to put a plug in for the um, Alberta Healthy Living Program out of Calgary is running a um, education, client education series. So this is for clients and it's open to all Albertans, not just in Calgary, it's free of charge. Um, and so you can find more information at that on the Alberta Healthy Living Program webpage. So please feel free um, to have a look at that. Yeah, go ahead, Christine, thank you. <laughs> Um, so Christina has included some of the resources and references that she used today. Those are on the slide deck. And again, the slide deck for today's presentation is, lo is um, located on the Allied Health Practice Hub. And I'll put the link in for that in a second here again, or um, you can go back earlier in the chat box because it was sent out to everybody. So there, that's housekeeping. I'm going to scroll back through to questions now. Uh, so Christine, or anybody else who wants to, to pop in, um, with post viral fatigue syndrome, have you noticed changes in the threshold level in the boom and bust cycles? In typical rehab, the energy levels will improve with activity. I'm wondering if you have seen a reverse correlation with the post viral fatigue and post exertional delays. That's a really good question. Um, if I think if I understood it correctly, you know what I mean? That as people start implementing energy, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Sherry, as yeah. people start implementing energy maximization strategies that they're actually kind of noticing a, a worsening before. Well, I think, I think here, I'm gonna put it into yeah. the box for you to see. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I'm gonna do that. So I think what they're saying is that traditionally we would see with activity energy levels improving. Are you seeing the opposite with, with your COVID patients? Uh, sometimes initially, and also it's kind of recognizing that fatigue is multifactorial, that there may be a different um, barrier that's going on here. Um, for example, mood or sleep, um, there'd be another factor that could be um, could be factoring into it. Uh, I'll open the floor to, to any of the other um, OTs who may want to speak to that at all. Okay. I'm wondering, this is Kathleen, I'm wondering if the question is related to um, when you're looking at some of the persistent pain um, teachings where their set point is a lot lower than it used to be. And the person that asked the question can clarify that. Or if we're seeing that the treatment has resumed with um, energy maximization, um, are you seeing a positive outcome? So I'm thinking without energy ma maximization, then they're, we're seeing the negative correlation where they're becoming um, more and less fatigue, so doing less and less and less as a result. So if you're naked and um, curved down with that one background, versus where you see the ebbs and flows with the curve going up once they start using energy maximization more effectively. Does that kind of fit the, the question and answer it? I think so. And, and Rick, if you need more clarification, feel free to jump in or to, to contact um, you know, Catherine or, or Christine a little bit after. Christine, were you going to add to that? I see you moved slides. You good? 
sorry, I'm muted, of course. That's okay. um, so looking at that uh, nonlinear recovery that people will take dips and, um, you, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's a prolonged dip and particularly if when they're in a dip, uh, they, you know, can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes it's just an, an overwhelming thought and emotion process that um, drives that feature downwards. But certainly in the beginning, they're going to be doing less than what they were. And it's going to feel like 20 steps backwards um, because they, they've been doing more, but they've been, you know, doing more on, on a couple of days, but then suffering for it for, for, you know, days to weeks afterwards. Sort of still on the fatigue topic, there's a question um, regarding sudden drops in, in uh, fatigue levels. So um, the question or the comment is, I had a couple of patients who state they feel mostly normal energy levels, but then sometimes they feel a sudden fatigue. Um, and specifically, are they still able to do the graded exercise? Um, so that, that's an interesting one, it's a very individualized question. So kind of hard to kind of comment on that because it's the factors depending on kind of what's contributing to, um, uh, to their readiness to return to, um, exercise. And again, you know, graded exercise and be careful with that term because it's that idea of, you know, can they do it for prolonged periods of time without creating post-exertional malaise, right? So it's not just one or two days doing, uh, you know, exercise that we're progressing very slowly and, and monitoring for those signs and symptoms, because the, the interesting thing is it can take, um, we talk about that definition of post-exertional malaise, um, is that it can be, um, you know, uh, days before you recognize it. So some people don't put that correlation of worsening symptoms it can be 12 to 48 hours after activity. So, you know, most people expect fatigue immediately after activity. So this is where this logging piece becomes important because that, um, you know, what I did two days ago actually might be affecting my energy today. And so that makes it a little bit tricky for tracking to figure out what actually created that drop in, in, in energy. Um, but it, we don't, you know, COVID uh, recovery is something that's still very much we're learning about and it's not following the, the the uh, the straight linear path that you know we would hope that it would and so it is it is a little uh, there's a lot of uncertainty so it's very kind of individualized for the client okay uh, next question is how should I advise my clients in the community to get connected to an OT to assist with post-COVID recovery do they need a referral from their GP good question anybody else program want to take that specific one mm -hmm. for Chris they do not do they Correct. We'll take self-referrals. Um, if they require only physical therapy needs, so they will be referred uh, to Rehab Advice Line or Community Physical Therapy. Um, there is multiple programs within Alberta Health Services that offer access to OTs. And I think, you know, if you look at a healthy living program at a Calgary, and they're, they're certainly looking to, you know, look at some group models as well, which I think is a really good way of approaching um, uh, for some clients uh, post-COVID recovery. And I think the rehab advice line is always a good, uh, a good place to go as a central um, resource. And so uh, that's a place that, because uh, it'll, it'll vary across the province, but um, that, uh, that group, uh, Alberta Healthy Living Program for Client, who certainly is uh, OTs are coordinating that. Um, and then for the individual one-on-one, um, uh, -on -one, maybe try the rehab advice line. Okay. Uh, do you believe these symptoms and strategies also apply to those in facility or supportive living? I think they can be used across the spectrum. Catherine, do you have thoughts? I agree with that as well. Um, on the supportive living note, I will also say uh, uh, there's a comment from, from uh, the um, health educator Heather from Supportive Living, who thanks you very much for reframing the thoughts um, from conservation to maximization, um, so much more strength-based. Um, can you suggest a quick reference guide for activity analysis for non-OTs or, or those who are not as well-versed in activity analysis? Oh, um, good question. I, you know, I think anything um, where it's breaking down the Royal College uh, that's referenced there, uh, they break down, they're using three Ps, uh, but they break it down nicely activities and give lots of nice examples in some of their OT reference stuff. So I think that's a, a really great resource. Um, but, you know, anything that's, you know, talking about the piece. So what we do is we have a, you know, activity analysis sheet and it has the, you know, the task is laundry and then it's, you know, there's the P's and we talk about how it can be, how it can be applied. Um, so it can be as basic as that, but there's lots of, you know, if you Google energy conservation or you, um, you, you will, you'll find lots of, lots of content, but the Royal College one has got a nice one specific to COVID. Okay, next question. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times that people feel ashamed. What are they saying they're ashamed of? 
uh, the lack of recovery, the expected recovery and those people around them expected recovery. It's poorly understood when people don't take a, a you know, linear progression of, of recovery. It's hard for, for others around them to understand that. Um, and also they, they feel like they're letting people down. They, that's a constant comment that I've heard time and time again in podcasts and from my clients is they don't want to let people down. So instead of listening to their body and resting when they need to, they push through for fear of letting other people down. I'm going to just put into the chat box, Christine, um, Rick, who was talking about the post, post viral fatigue earlier, um, just asked for a, um, oh, hold on, maybe I didn't do the right, uh, uh, sorry, he'd asked, he'd given some clarification, and I'm, I apologize, I just pasted the wrong thing in here, the clarification, um, and I don't know, Rick, can you come off mute, or we got everybody else, I have a feeling that all of the um, participants are muted. Um, all muted. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so Rick is just saying what he's getting um, to was that in post viral fatigue and post exertional malaise, is there more energy used to do an activity in comparison to a non COVID client? Very good question. Um, so as far as like an you know, activity analysis, like metabolic equivalency table kind of approach things, really good. And I think it depends on, do they have some of those primary um, fatigue factors uh, that could be contributing to that versus just secondary fatigue factors? So, you know, dyspnea, uh, you know, people are short of breath and their their lungs aren't working properly or they're having cardiac issues, then yeah, it's quite, it's quite possible. Or, you know, just generally they're using more energy because they're weaker than they used to be. So um, I, I don't know as much about that. I'm I'm sorry, I can't speak to that better, but I suspect there is, but I certainly, I haven't seen anything come out as far as um, activity and like um, metabolic level and activity analysis at, at this point. Okay. Um, somebody was just asking for clarification about which Royal College um, um, handout you were referring to, and that is in the references or the resources. There's a couple of different um, Royal College uh, um uh, resources. One is uh, on an OT quick guide and the other is on uh, uh, a practical guide to energy conservation, I believe were the two in there, right? Okay. Correct. And the practical guide for energy conservation would be the one that um, would best support the, the question that came earlier. Great. I hope that answers that, um, Heather. Um, the Rehab Advice Line number has also been put into the chat box. And so the um, Rehab Advice Line team is always happy to navigate services and give advice um, as well. Another question for clients who are months post, what are your recommendations for excessive daytime napping in addition to the eight plus hours per night of sleep? Mm -hmm. You know, it's that building the daytime activity or building the sleep drive, the more that you're sleeping in the day. So we kind of talk about it like a, a balloon, right? Is that every activity you do and they builds up your sleep drive. So, you know, if your balloon isn't very full, it kind of the air slowly escapes from it. If you want to fall asleep quickly and have a good sleep, you need a really full balloon. And so every time they nap, they're letting air out of that balloon. Um, and so it's going to be harder to fall asleep and stay asleep because they're sleeping during the day. Um, so again, it's kind of looking at, is there other ways of restorative rest versus just napping, right? Um, napping isn't the only way to get rest um, and that their their napping is could likely be what's reducing their 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 sleep drive at night awesome i know maureen uh is also on the call here i don't know if maureen if you had anything to add feel free to jump in otherwise i'm sorry for putting you on the spot <laughs> uh no thanks I, I think that my only thought was it almost sounded like that client was requiring like the full eight hours at night plus additional daytime sleep and I do think that, you know, we have to consider that there can be increased sleep, sleep needs during recovery. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at good consolidated night sleep and the need to rest during the day and looking at those other factors, like Christine mentioned, um, is there meaningful engagement in activity, especially if they haven't been able to return back to work, as well as is that night sleep actually restorative? And that may be where you want to look at some um, sleep disorder screening as well and possible referrals on as needed for sleep testing or other um, information during actual sleep. Thank you, Maureen. Okay, we're kind of running to the end of the questions in the chat box. I wonder if anybody else wants to take this chance uh, while they have this opportunity, while we've got people, or I apologize if I've missed anything, I'm scrolling through again. Um, so once again, um, uh, reminder that the, the uh, we've put in the um, address for the Allied Health Practice Education Hub again in the chat box. So the slide deck is there as well as the presentation from last week um, and the calendars for the upcoming sit, um, 
uh, upcoming sessions. I did see one more question come in. Thanks, Dean. How important it is to include quote, close stakeholders in energy maximization, maximization education to decrease some of the mental distress associated with letting others down. Pass that one on to uh, Catherine, if you wanna give that one a go. I was, I was muted. Um, the support of uh, caregivers is always integral into assisting um, people attain their, their goals. And when you're looking at functional goals, um, if you can have the, the caregiver to help with gentle reminders, um, sometimes they can um, be perceived as negative or perhaps a bit nagging. So if there's, if you can help the, the support of others, um, Couch the, the the request or change the language so it is it is supportive in that sense. Then you can often um, move forward uh, a lot quicker in that respect. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's just recognizing it's that self-compassion, right? It's like you're doing the best you can and recognizing that, you know, you didn't ask to get sick likely. And you know, it, you know, it's 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 meeting meeting yourself where you're at and being kind to self. So I was just trying to find that reference there to uh, resources that Royal College of Occupational Therapists there. Yeah, 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 and this one here. Excellent. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. Um, sorry, I had something in my head and it's gone now, but that's okay, because I'm multitasking. Okay, well, um, uh, one more question coming in. I know it's early days for post-COVID recovery stats, but anecdotally, are we seeing re are we seeing recovery in these clients? Some of the reports in the media state that these deficits could be lifelong. Yeah, um, so I talked with Toronto Rehab, and they've been seeing post-COVID clients for about uh, since July, um, and some of the clients I'm working with are 16 months post. So um, there's certainly a risk of this becoming more lifelong and turning into something like ME or chronic fatigue. That is definitely something that's being um, seen and identified uh, out there. I'm just trying to remember the first part of the question. Um, uh, just anecdotally, are we seeing recovery? Yes, we are. And so um, both in both sets of populations, um, we're seeing, rec you know, re recovery. And I mean, I've only been working with some of my post-COVID clients now for a couple of weeks. And, and those are some of the direct quotes that I took from you that, that I provided for you, right? So they, they are seeing recovery once they kind of get a... Um, uh, put some of those emotions, uh, you know, uh, to the, to the wayside and start focusing on the plan. They've been doing this on their own for a long time and not having success. Um, so yeah, I know they're seeing, and, and at a Toronto and I car program in Calgary, I know they've been seeing clients and I, I know there's, um, it's talking, uh, emailing with uh, Sam there and he's had some really good success to the point where somebody's post ICU and is now going back to work. And, and those are some really exciting stories. So yeah, we are absolutely seeing, seeing recovery, but we are also seeing some clients who are, um, who are experiencing some more longer term uh, impact from this. So that's, I think, where it's kind of a shout out for maybe getting rehab for some of these people that aren't, um, aren't managing um, to make the recovery uh, as, as, as well as, as maybe could be making it. Okay, and then I just had a, a question just about where exactly was the presentation. So if you follow the, the link to the um, Practice Education Hub, uh, the title of the presentation is Post-COVID Recovery, Maximizing Energies and Activity of Daily Living. And then it has today's date, June 15th. So if you're having any difficulty accessing that, then just uh, just give an email out to practice consultation and we will um, we'll make sure you get a, a copy of that. All right. Christine, well, sorry, it's Carmen. Um, there's a couple of questions coming to me directly. Christine, would you mind going back to the reference page and just show again the Royal College reference, please? Right here. This is the one on conserving energy, practical advice. Um, and then there's a quick guide for OTs as well. And um, one of my favorite documents that I found was this one out of uh, kind of the, the West Coast, out of kind of the BC area um, that talks about post-exertional malaise and like gives a link to this website, which I've used a lot in my practice, which is the Chronic Fatigue Self-Help website. They've got great stuff on pacing, some awesome logging forms and just some tutorials. So if you don't have a lot of time to work with a client, they can go through and work through some of that on their own. Anything else from you, Carmen? 
Uh, just a, one more shout out, please, Sherry, to where people can access the presentation. Yes. Uh, so there we go. There's the link there. And uh, again, if you have any trouble, then give us a, give us an email, and we will uh, will uh, send you the direct uh, the direct link as well. So. Okay, well, um, knowing it's 1230 and, and uh, thank you for those of you who are uh, donating your, uh, your lunch hours. I know that it's, uh, it, it's uh, lots going on right now. So thank you so much to um, Christine. Christine, there's been a number of, of other comments from people just saying how much they appreciate this, uh, specifically one from somebody who is a healthcare provider living with long COVID and they pointed out they felt really seen um, and appreciated and this really resonated. So great job to you as well as to everybody um, who contributed. Lots Lots of, uh, lots of uh, help from different places across the province is much appreciated. And uh, again, we invite you to join us the same time next week where um, we'll have a presentation on um, exercise and activity. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Okay.